Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we're always bumping it up a few notches, and one of our now most favorite guests that we're going to have on regularly is Professor James McCanny, probably the uh, professor, in a sense, that b- popularized and brought forward the science of the plasma universe, the electric universe, uh, no more than Dr. McCanny. Also, the issues of <coughs> rogue planets, trinary and, and, and binary star systems, <coughs> the idea that comets are highly charged objects, that come into our solar system and can have plasma effects as well as gravitational effects on on the sun and planets. Uh, this is really important science because space weather and near space astronomy is incredibly important in terms of uh, cycles for extinction level events, uh, changes in activity of the sun, uh, crop failures, all kinds of issues that have direct effect on, on life on Earth. Uh, and even have had effects on the fall of kingdoms over the times with many ice ages and much more. So, Professor McKinney, let's start off with some of the most amazing announcements you've done on your, in your own radio show. And, of course, the website, the best website, the short version is jmccsci.com. jmccsci.com. Uh, so, Professor McKinney, welcome to the program. Thanks, Bill. Dr. Bill, thank you for, and I'm sure, like you say, we'll have a lot of uh, interviews like this in the future. But Yeah, uh, this is yeah. Uh, important. Let's, let's start off with some of the key topics you want to talk about, because everybody wants to know about things like, quote, the Planet X thing, rogue planets, the Sedna. Uh, we have a giant comet that has already been identified in the public media that's uh, coming in, uh, the C-2012 S-1 comet that's going to be coming in October, November of 2013. Uh, really close to Mars. Tell us all about that, and w- how significant is this, and how will it teach us what's going on? Well, it's uh, it's the first comet in uh, notable history that's going to come very, very, very near a planet, which is the planet Mars, and I believe that's going to be about October 3rd next year. Uh, and this is very big because Mars will be in the coma of this comet. That's the big dust gas cloud around the comet. And uh, furthermore, uh, if the comet is small, which I don't think it is, uh, Mars will change its orbit significantly. Um, And we don't know what that's going to turn out to be because we don't know the mass of this comet. I think it's going, this comet is a medium to larger sized nucleus, which means it's going to affect the orbit of Mars. When it leaves Mars, uh, Mars atmosphere will change. Something Mars has a very faint atmosphere right now. Mars will have a different atmosphere by the time this comet passes and leaves. Uh, we may see electrical discharging between the comet and Mars. All of these things uh, in standard science right now is just about as quiet as a church mouse over all of these issues uh, because they've been saying all along comets are dirty snowballs, uh, don't worry about these little icy wanderers, this kind of thing. And this this comet could be the one where the public looks up in the sky and says, "Hey NASA, that ain't no little snowball." Yeah, what it's doing, and then yeah, it's going to be 15 times brighter than the moon, so they're yeah. not going to be able to ignore it. And of course, if you look at even pictures through the Middle Ages, uh, pictures of comets that were painted into you know art during the Renaissance and before. These were major harbingers of destruction. They were not considered uh, really friendly things to happen in the sky. Right, and that's historical. And uh, the, the hardest, the most, uh, the effort that NASA has put into anything over the past, oh, since the 1970s, or even before, back to the 50s, it, uh, before NASA even existed, the astronomy community has tried to persuade the public that comets are really nothing to worry about. They're just those little puffy things out there, nothing to worry about. And everything in our history tells us that these things, the big ones, uh, NASA always wants to quote little comets and no, nothing happened. Uh, But uh, throughout history, we have seen major things happen when big comets come through the solar system. So they fail to differentiate between big and small. There's a lot of uh, soft shoe dancing going around here about this topic of, of comets, but this comet C2012 S1 is one to watch. In yeah, fact, yeah. January 15th of 2013, so that's right around the corner, we are going to have and the first good electrical interaction with this comet with the planet is going to actually be with comet uh, with planet Earth. 
and this is January 15th, so we could, we'll probably get our first reading of the strength of this comet. Uh, yeah, so in other words, there's going to be a plasma discharge across the interstellar space. And uh, there's also a comet coming by that's going to be about 197 meters across. They say 5,000 miles uh, above the surface of the Earth, but every time they recalculate, it gets closer and closer. It used to be 100,000 miles, uh, which is you know a little less than half the distance to the moon, or you know, one half L LD or lunar distance. And now it's getting closer and closer, but they stopped two and a half months ago releasing the data. Uh, it appears that the military and the government don't want us to know about near-Earth objects anymore. It's now considered all classified. Why is that? Well, yeah, it's, it's a program. If you look at what I'd call the commercial side of NASA, the part head by uh, David Morrison, uh, that's the part that they feed to the public. And once David Morrison said in public that they don't have any equipment. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you're the near-Earth object resource group for the for NASA, and you don't have any equipment? But on uh, Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii, the military has some of the most incredible optical and infrared astronomical, astronomical equipment in the world, and it's hooked to the biggest supercomputer in the world for calculations. But like you say, this information is not... Get out to the public. It's, a, it's all black op. We have, for example, IRAS, which is the infrared telescope. Wise, which is a wide angle space telescope for looking at infrared. We've got the Chandra X ray telescope. We have the uh, stereoscopic telescopes so looking at solar activity. We have the South Pole telescopes, etc. And none of this information is coming out to the public about whether there's near Earth objects, objects out in the Oort cloud, like Sedna that was identified a few years ago. Uh, this is very disturbing because it will affect the Earth. And well, some of these nearest objects are whipping by at incredible high velocity, 35,000 miles an hour, and they're not little. They're, you know, they're several hundred meters in size or larger. This object that uh, was posted up, which we, we said passed the sniff test, but we can't find anything more about it, about this Canadian astronomer and, and uh, astronaut that said there was an 800-meter object that was heading toward Antarctica that was going to strike sometime before the end of 2012. Well, I can't find anything else, but this astronaut has talked about this. Could you, have you heard anything about this? Quote story about an 800 meter object heading toward Antarctica um, no. before the end of 2012. I, no, I can't I find have, anything I have more. Not. I have, yeah, not. I have a, and I know those things. It's almost like you got to grab them when you see them because when you go back, they're not there, and that's all you're going to ever see on it. Yeah, apparently but, somebody uh, said they saw it, but they, I never saw what's called a screenshot. That's also something missing. No screenshot of the actual data. Although I've seen video clips of this astronaut talking about near Earth objects and very upset, very energized over the fact we don't have a very advanced, collaborative, you know, worldwide defense of Earth like uh, like Linda LaRouche talks about space program. I know Space Command, which is U.S. and Canadian, basically has very little participation from even the European space agencies and none from Russia or China. And as a result, we're not really presenting information to the typical scientists at universities or feeding back information to people like yourself that can convey it or explain it to the public so they can understand that, yes, space weather and these space objects are dangerous. The things that can end life on Earth are plasma effects, gravitonic effects, coronal mass ejections, and giant objects that whip by our planet that ended the life of the dinosaur 62 million years ago. Right, exactly, and and I like that you you're mentioning that uh, something I've said all along that these objects don't have to hit Earth. No. They can pass by and cause a lot more damage. The bigger ones uh, can cause tremendous damage, and they don't hit us at all. Well, they uh, could do something like uh, cause our magnetic field to flip or, or collapse temporarily. And that could allow cosmic background radiation. Uh, you could have a coronal mass ejection triggered by the sun that could be hit us close enough or glance at us close enough. It could knock out our satellites and our ground-based uh, transmission lines. All kinds of stuff can happen. And uh, we're just being kept in the dark. That's, that's Except for people true. like yourself that are teaching the people every day and every week you do your show. We come back much more with Professor James McCanny. Again, the website is jmcc. SCI.com. Welcome back to the uh, Nutra Medical Report with Professor James McCanny, and his website is jmccsci.com, is the short version. Uh, you mentioned some interesting uh, details in the break, Professor McCanny. 
Uh, one of them is that they had to demote Pluto as a planet because they found objects bigger, and Pluto has a moon around it, which means it could have, they could have to add up to 40 planets. And if you look at the different uh, distribution of sizes, some of them could be even larger than Jupiter uh, out there, and they could be displacing comets, even firing just like gravitational. People don't realize when you go on a roller coaster or when you're an extreme skier, you're using gravity as an accelerator, the same way these planetoids or planetary-sized objects could be accelerating and whipping comets into the inner solar system periodically if their orbits cross uh, mi- billions of these comet-sized uh, snowballs out in the deep space in the Oort cloud. Um, is that a possibility? Well, ex- exactly, yeah. The, uh, we don't know what's out there. Uh, I think NASA has a good reading on it, and, and I have to clarify this, too that uh, I have defined what I call Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 science. The, the public, or what the public thinks is top layer of science in the world, NASA, etc., is really Tier 2. And it's the garbage science that's passed off to the public, which is very little. Pretty pictures right. from the Hubble Space Telescope every now and then. Tier 1 science is funded by groups which include the people who run the International Monetary Fund, in the world banking and what I call secret societies, the people that really control what's going on. And throughout history, leaders, real leaders of the world, have always known they have to keep the public stupid about science and engineering to maintain power. So uh, when I say NASA knows, I would say that tier one layer, that upper layer, that's the mill, I would call it the military side of NASA, they know they have information, but they're not passing it down to the other second layer scientists uh, yeah, or yeah. to the public. Uh, I, I'm going to quote one of my uh, PhD colleagues at high level security <clears throat> clearance, and he said many years ago, back in the mid 90s, he said to me that uh, 4% of the knowledge is at tier two that goes to the levels of tenured university professors in physics and astrophysics, etc. In any university from Cambridge to around the world, 96% of the sum total of advanced knowledge is on a need-to-know basis, and you're only invited in there in these secret orders to have specific compartmentalized information. And some of this is very ancient, and it's extremely well-funded because, for example, the money that's been printed up by, say, the Fed Reserve is trillions and trillions of dollars in, in projects that people just can't even imagine exist. But they do. It's not science fiction. They exist. And some of the stuff is even open, like the WISE telescope, the infrared telescopes got IRAS, the conjoint project between Germany and America to put a Boeing jet up with a uh, infrared telescope of forty to fifty thousand feet to see at that level there's very little tropospheric interference with infrared analysis of deep space objects. Uh, they know far more than they're saying, and then you just have to look at their behavior. Why are they not telling the public? Because they're not preparing us for major Earth changes, plasma effects, gravitonic effects, volcanic effects. Uh, even effects on the uh, magnetosphere that could cause the South Atlantic anomaly to cause a major collapse that could have major effects on the oceans or on populations like in uh, Rio de Janeiro and uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, where if that descended to the ground, it would kill people almost instantly. And people are not aware of this. They just start going to work and thinking everything's fine. And the global elite don't even tell you that when the South Pole anomaly hits, if it get lowered into the range where commercial aircraft are flying, they would lose control of their aircraft because the background space radiation would fry their integrated circuits of their airline control and their communications. It's just, they don't tell anybody anything, do they? No, and, and that's really true. Uh, so we're living like uh, like laboratory rats, if you will, and it's a, it's a bad comparison, but it's really true. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, I just saw today, I was looking up on the Comet C-2012-S1, and uh, that if you look on Google, which is a controlled search engine, you come up with Scientific American as the top thing. And you would think, gee, that must be the top scientific information on this object. But it's all fluffy duff, uh, uh, you know, mumbo jumbo. And it really, they, they absolutely it, it, don't talk about this thing coming near Mars. Why right. would you not talk about this thing coming near Mars when that's a major event mars is going to be in the coma of this thing it's going to come close it's going to change the orbit but they talk about it like it's uh, just going to pass by and they, they don't even mention mars one of the things that's going to stop a lot of this is citizen astronomers citizen scientists 
or can do all kinds of experiments, like when we had talked about Stan Dale with his gravitonic experiments. As citizen astronomers have some pretty powerful scopes and technologies that can look at the sun, can look at deep space, and are going to start identifying anomalies that uh, they're going to start adding one and one together. And yeah. when they look at your models, the models that you've put out scientifically that explain this, it's going to blow the lid off the fact that the governments are conspiring to keep the public in the dark at our peril. And that's the big part is it's at our peril. Peril of crops, populations, communication systems, power grids, uh, coastal areas, all kinds of things. Because if you have, say, an ocean strike of a large uh, asteroid or comet, you're going to have a tsunami half a mile high. Uh, if you have a, a, this, like this story, which we gave, said passed the sniff test, of a 800 meter comet striking Antarctica, if it hit the Ross ice shelf or the uh, the northern ice shelf in Antarctica, you could have major effects on the oceans of the world. But they're not going to tell us anything, and they're going to say everything's fine, and the, the 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 ether of normalcy is is permeating the population to tell us just go back to sleep everything's fine you're not going to have a carrington event that would cause the fires of papers by somebody's uh, telegraph machine to go on fire or rail ties to burn uh, 150 years ago that that couldn't happen again of course these events happen on a century basis regularly from the sun this is nothing anomalous it's not a millennial or or decamillennial event it's something that happens on a century basis yeah exactly but it's see it's a comet like this it, that could come in, and the people look up in the sky. In every, I mean, in the, imagine this comet if it produces what they are predicting, and which I think it can do. In the oh, daylight, boy. you see something 15 times brighter than the full moon, wow. and stretching across the sky with tails wheeling around and zapping electrical discharges off to little objects in space, and people can see this. No. Okay, you're the military trying to say, okay, now that's a fluffy little snowball up there, boys and girls. You know, it's just going to blow the lid off everything. And that's why, uh, now here's a good example. Whenever there's a comet, uh, like Comet Ellen, and there was all kinds of hype and misinformation, and there were people jumping up and down and all kinds of uh, controlled websites say, giving misinformation, it'd be the end of the world. What's interesting is there's none of that, none at all, with this comet. And those, a lot of those sites, I'd say the majority, are very controlled. So the controlled, uh, the end of the world is going to happen with this comet. Those websites are quiet as a church mouse, which tells me that they're real worried about this comet. Because well, they and don't they say want it passes anybody us. to look at it. It passes, not real close, but it passes by Earth in February, but then it passes further out toward the orbit of Mars around October 3rd. Right, right. And then uh, there are, uh, on my show last week, I outlined uh, some other scenarios where it has a real good electrical alignment with the planet Mercury and another one with Venus. Uh, so these individual events, if it maintains its same orbit, uh, are going to happen. Then it passes within 1.6 billion miles of the sun. So it's going to be a sun grazer, a whopping big comet. Uh, that's, a bit, that's really close. 1.6 million, right? back and professor mccanny um we, we need to talk about solutions here because what we have is we have what's called the uh edwin musk's uh owns paypal uh spacex program and the dragon with a giant contract with nasa to supply the space station we have what's called a commercialized side that wants to eventually have expensive billionaire tourists go for a weekend into zero gravity at a space station type hotel uh, but then what's going on is the, the NASA space program, basically under Obama, has been shut down. The public space program where data to scientists like yourself and the public uh, is not being kept, becoming available. That means technologies that are developed in zero gravity, the nature of the plasma universe, all kinds of things that could trickle down to business and technology and healing and all kinds of areas that are non-warfare. Uh, and these are all classified. And they always say national security when, in fact, they actually are decreasing national security by not letting this information out to the public. 
Well, yeah, the, the other thing is, too, a lot of these issues have to do with energy, and one of the biggest controlling factors on the public today is world energy. Uh, what I've been teaching for a long time is there's a tremendous amount of energy, electrical energy, passing by Earth, and we know how to tap into it. I know how to do this. Uh, but yeah. uh, you and uh, the, the black ops people, I've, I get to talk to them occasionally, and uh, I had a naval f physicist come up to me one day. I was giving a talk in 2003. And uh, I had mentioned that the naval submarines are using bimetal strips as power, and that's a way they can derive power for the, their propellers and go run silent, run deep type of mode. And he came up to me after the talk and he says, you can't talk about this anymore. He says, you figured out what we're doing, but uh, you can't talk about it anymore. And, and, and then he said, you know, I'm amazed at what you're doing. He said, just doing what you're doing. Uh, yeah, in other words, what you're talking about is energy from a vacuum. In other words, the uh, the the vortex, the dark field energy matter, the ma that, that literally flows around the Earth and literally creates the substance of space time, is literally infinite energy, and there's no need yeah. for energy shortage. Just the same way as we had uh, Professor Corsi on the first hour on on Monday this week on the eighth, talking about the uh, abiotic oil scam that was proven by the Nazi Germans back in the 1930s, that and 40s that there's no shortage of oil, but oil is a, is a minor portion of the energy needs of the planet. Uh, we could yeah. have plasma distribution networks, tokamak fusion reactors. I know from my sources that we uh, can use helium-3 fusion reactors that would produce no radioisotopes and no byproducts and would not be dangerous, and they can be miniaturized as well. There's just no need for either pollution, energy shortages, which is the currency of the planet. The currency is not gold or silver or dollars or even electronic currency. It's energy. Energy is Absolutely. the currency of every culture. And if you if you look at, like, say you go buy a hot dog today, how much of that hot dog price is energy to make it, to process it, to grow the corn, to get fed the, the beef or whatever, and, and you go, you look right down the line. I did an analysis one time in transportation, in the grocer, the people have to drive to go buy it. The cost of that hot dog is 80 to 90 percent energy. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, there's about less 10 than ten percent is the actual. Less than ten percent is anything else. Yeah, and so you're paying these astronomical prices for things. Well, of course, there's going to be economic chaos. How can you sustain when one branch of the society, which should be a small kind of pimple, uh, uh, like communications, is another example. These should be small pimples on the side of our overall economy. Yet they're the main central core of the economy. What's wrong with this picture, you know? Of course we can't be sustainable. Uh, we can't have a s sustainable economy or, uh, um, and people are working uh, two jobs just to try and make ends meet. Well, it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's not working. Well, we need also these ideas that you mentioned about energy sources so we can do projects like uh, geoengineer the planet to create things like the Wapa North American Energy and Water, to literally change the planetary safety areas so it's safe to, put, to, to have populations in areas where there won't be in danger of a tsunami, an earthquake, or other things, and to get away from old nuclear technology, which is patently dangerous. Um, oh, it's terrible. It's, the people just have no idea how dangerous nuclear is. Not only the, rea the, uh, the accidents, but the waste that we have stored hundreds and hundreds of casts of radioactive waste stored around nuclear power plants and someday and those most of them have to be cooled and so yeah, there's yeah. A, a point of no return in which you have to produce more and more energy simply to cool the spent fuel yeah and if that reactor ever goes down <laughs> those things are going to mess uh, yeah you get 50 years of energy and 5 billion years of pollution yeah, it, it is not a good deal. No, bad, bad. And it also costs more than any other form of energy. Um, so, Professor McKinney, I want to move on to the topic of uh, the people want to know about Planet X. They want to know, firstly, I don't like to call it Planet X because we know there's many objects that are coming into our solar system. I have lots of information that indicates that the powers that be know that there's going to be major changes to our planet. The, the one that I've been told recently 
is uh, and confirmed over pretty years is that any kind of planetary effect from a a sister star to the to the to our sun, which would probably be a red dwarf, would be a plasma effect, which fits in with your thesis. It doesn't have to come in within 55 million miles of Earth in order to have major effects on the planet. And the people don't grasp that the government's purposely hiding this data. Uh, whatever it is, because I don't know the dates, but I can tell you the evidence that I've seen and information suggests that there's not only comets and asteroids, these big rocks from space, but there's also uh, planetoid-sized objects that could be coming in, or uh, a dwarf stars that can have ma- major periodic effects. There's some pretty good evidence that every 3,600 years there's a uh, what I call a sub-extinction level event, a major Earth change event that occurs, triggered up by an object that approaches near uh, our inner solar system, and it may well be a dwarf star or one of these large planetoid-like objects, but it could be simply plasma discharges that produce a lot of these effects. Uh, can you expand on that and tell us what your theories are and what data is out there? Uh, the the 3,600-year time frame? Yes. And, and uh, any, of these, any of these cycles uh, that are out there, because there's a bunch yeah, the, of cycles. Yeah, the 3,600-year the ago time frame was when Venus, the comet, came through and became the planet Venus. About 4,200 years ago, Hale-Bopp was here again and had a different orbit. Uh, we think that that orbit that it had before before uh, was Earth crossing. The one it has now is actually Earth crossing. Uh, but at any rate, uh, those are two events that we know about. Um, oh, really? So, so Venus was actually a, a large uh, planetoid that actually came in and was captured in an orbit. And by Jupiter, and that's what the, the Velikovsky story that is poo-pooed by science. But what I found is, is very real. It's very, very real. Oh, yeah, um, it's spinning in the opposite direction. You look at it and say, oh, this doesn't make sense. Every other planet is spinning in the opposite direction to Venus. And when you look at the uh, at the nature of the size of the planet and where the way it's behaving, it doesn't behave like any of the other near-Earth object planets in the inner solar system, does it? No, there was an analysis done by a chemist, by the way, his uh, name is Newell, and he analyzed the atmosphere of Venus, and he said, this is a new planet. He says, all of these chemicals are very harsh chemicals which have a, a lifetime that when cooled down, they would change into other forms like water. But you've got sulfur, sulfuric acid raining out of the sky. I mean, you have sulfur, sulfuric acid clouds. Uh, right. But... Uh, and these are chemicals that would break down and change as the planet cooled. He says, this is a young planet. Uh, but uh, back to the original uh, topic about planet X type objects. Uh, so the 3,600 year ago, a lot of times people confused that with the planet Venus event. Um, but what about because there's, there are, there's also uh, other uh, 3,600 year cycles that appear to be present there and multiples like 11,800 years, which right. is like three times that cycle. Something's going on in that those cycles that, and I'd, I'd like to flesh this out when we come back in the next uh, segment. Welcome back, and uh, yeah, Professor McKinney, so uh, this, uh, the research on Venus, the Venusian theory, which uh, Velikovsky, by the way, was well respected by Einstein and other scientists, he wasn't just a, uh, a peripheral person, um, that Venus was literally a planetary object carried as in orbit around another star that was coming into our solar system around 5,000 years ago, about th- or 3,600 years ago, that literally was captured by Jupiter and that this there's evidence that there is a 3600 year periodicity cycle we know that the volcanism on earth and the destruction of thera that destroyed the minoans we know that the debris that fell and all the environmental changes that occurred for the quote plagues of egypt fall specifically and in in, in scientifically valid order what you'd expect in terms of ther- of telluric currents driving the insects and the snakes out of the ground etc uh Something is really afoot a here, and I think the globalists and the scientists in this Category 1 science are trying to hide it from the public in terms of the approach of a dwarf star, either most likely a red dwarf or an object that has orbital objects around it and debris, and that this object is coming into our inner solar system, and it's going to cause some havoc, and the globalists 
are building underground cities at an enormous pace. They're absolutely determined to get a new financial con- complete control matrix order over quote, the civilian population, not because they're trying to save us, but because they don't want us to interfere with their continuity of civilization and government plans. I really right, believe that exactly. they're expecting an extinction-level event, and they're trying to hide the fact that they've selected out specific individuals to be seed stock, like the Sakhalin Island uh, super uh, seed vault, and that they're getting ready, uh, not telling the public. And that's why they want to have a global control system like the current administration with Obama and administrations in other countries like China, which they've supported the communist regime there. Uh, and at the same time, they're keeping the public like mushrooms in the dark and feeding us uh, you know what? So um, <laughs> exactly. No, so that's, it, a, that's a good analysis, and it's, uh, uh, I would say uh, somewhere in there, you're about ninety nine point nine nine percent right on all of that. Yeah. Well, uh, my so sources the are. The question is timing. Uh, uh, I, I took care of a, a scientist going to McMurdo Bay back in the mid '90s. I have contacts in the South Pole Telescope. Contacts have sent me information from IRS and other sources. I know that this infrared object can be picked up with infrared telescope, telescopy, uh, X-ray telescope, telescopy, and radio telescopy, such as the Arecibo. They know it's coming in. Uh, I don't know the exact dates, but I do know it has orbital objects coming around it, which can include planetary and comet size objects. Uh, what you're saying is that the Velikovsky theory is that Venus was a object that was coming in, that was literally in the orbit of this passing dwarf star and was captured by the orbit of, uh, by the gravitational field of Jupiter and the Sun, and therefore rotates in the opposite direction because it wasn't originally a, uh, if you want to call it a Sol, which is the name of our Sun, solar object. It was actually a captured planetary object that's in a much earlier state of development. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, my belief on G- Venus was that exactly, Velikovsky was exactly right, and uh, that Venus and Hilbop were companions. And Venus went one way, Hilbop went the other way. They both had interactions with Jupiter around 4,200 years ago, and it took Venus about 600 years working its way through the solar system to p- finally become the planet, it passed by Mars, ripped the atmosphere and oceans off of Mars, and when it passed by Earth, we got a pretty good uh, lambasting there twice. According to the Mayans, we know that those two events were 54 years apart. We know a lot about this. And then eventually Venus worked its way in, uh, in and by a process I call tail drag, the drag of the tail on the comet in the, the plasma discharge comet model my comet model shows that the, the nucleus of the comet is pulling in the tail material, and that creates a drag on the nucleus, which changes its orbit into a more circular orbit. So at any rate, this whole process is explained, and uh, uh, but that's what my vision of Venus is, and it's brand new. Uh, NASA cannot, uh, they've got their little rover on Mars, and they just made an announcement saying, well, gee, there must have been water but it had to be billions of years ago. And then you look at Mars, it's got pristine little riverbeds that are uh, like the day they were had water in them. You have erosion on the side of Olympus Mons. You have sloughing off of big chunks of material off the side of the volcano of Olympus Mons, which would have been due to an ocean there. And NASA goes, well, we think there might have been water, you know? Well, if you look at it, they look like a, a swimming pool with the water drained out. You look at it and you see rivers, you see canals. These are not man-made canals. These are canals caused by the natural flow of water on the planet. So the the planet obviously had a cataclysmic event that ripped off its atmosphere and water. And recently, because Mars has tremendous dust storms that destroy everything. In a couple, in a very short period of time, all of this geological, uh, uh, all of these features would be destroyed. And certainly over two billion years, you wouldn't see yeah. this. And the other thing is, of course, that they always show pictures, too, of Mars, where they show the sky is red, but in actual fact, if you were on the Martian surface, the sky would appear blue because that's just a principle of light. The second thing is that there probably is water deposits underneath the ground, especially in the, in the polar and subpolar areas, which means if they're going to find any form of life, bacterial or otherwise, they would find it in the subpolar areas uh, where there is some light uh, underground. Yeah, they... Uh I, I like the picture when the, the most recent lander landed and they showed the landscape 
there's all these rounded hills, nice, beautifully rounded hills. It's, it's everything you saw, round pebbles. Everything yeah. you saw in that picture was a result of water erosion and the presence of water. And, yeah. But they just can't, they can't quite decide if there was water there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Now, the cataclysm on Earth was pretty significant, and uh, this would also fit in with the, 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 the flood hypothesis about Noah and the flood, that there were cataclysmic changes to the Earth that occurred around those, those times as well. Yeah, the, the Noah's flood preceded what I, the Velikovsky Venus event was what I call the Moses event. Uh, right. And, and the, the, the Quetzalcoatl of the Incas, the Mayas, uh, the ancient Incas and Mayas, and, but the Noah event happened thousands of years earlier because the, the Old Testament of the Bible is nothing more than a genealogy of the people between Noah and Moses. Right. And, and, so, and that's all it is. It's the genealogy and the history of that event of the Great Flood. Uh, right. Oddly enough, the Great Flood is not even ta taught in history in schools today. It's like mythology. They, nobody teaches it because they don't think it even happened. And it's the, one of the most formative events in the history of all of mankind. That shows how distorted education is today. Yeah, and one of the, uh, the good theories that I've seen recently is that it was the massive flooding, the, the expansion, dramatic expansion of the Black Sea that occurred when a major barrier broke between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea through the, through the Bosporus that occurred because of the earth changes and that that great flood would accomplish, be accomplished also by great floods from the sky and great earth changes in the ground because there's fault lines that run right through the Bosporus. Uh, well, yeah, but the, 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 the biblical flood was 40 days and 40 nights of, of torrential rain. And, uh, right, and that makes sense, too, because the, the plasma discharges would cause rain, wouldn't they, in, in your theory? Well, the, the, the comet tail, we passed uh, 40 days and 40 nights. I figured that, for example, if we, as planet Earth, passed through the tail of comet hale -Bopp, which was a possibility, right. uh, uh, just say that the orbital situation was correct, we would have spent about 35 days in the comet tail. And then it would have rained, wow. we'd have uh, torrential rains, the, the naphtha, the rain of, uh, of uh, brimstone and fire. And so, at any rate, uh, the Noah's flood is very realistic. We passed through the tail of a big comet, 40 days and 40 nights. And yeah. gee, how did, how did Noah know this was going to happen? How did he know to build a boat? Well, because someone back there well, uh, had the knowledge uh, to know that this thing was coming, and he built his boat out in the middle of nowhere. And people were laughing at him. Right. You know, what he was building in a building? desert area, basically. Yeah, and then it started to rain, and I think the, the people stopped laughing. Right. Now, this interesting is a lot of this knowledge is passed down through the ancient, we call hey, priest dudes of ancient Sumer and Egypt and these other cultures of Mesoamerica. But it was passed down through now the current, what are called the high priests or the agencies like NSA, no such agency, CIA, uh, secret uh, science, uh, secret orders, etc., where they hide this knowledge of the ancient world in these periodic cycles of cataclysms. Great. Well, you would stop paying your house payment, insurance payment, and uh, live a different lifestyle if you knew this was the way the world really worked. I guess it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. Amazing That's discussion. A, we need to get back on soon. Amazing discussion today. Professor James McCanny. And again, you do a regular show. Go to the website if you want to hear more in his radio broadcast. Absolutely essential knowledge. JMCCSCI.com. Jim McCanny Science at JMCCSCI.com. Thank you, Professor McCanny. Back tomorrow with Dr. Ed Ward and the further analysis of the use of nukes at the World Trade Center demolition.